In a recent unbagging video, I received two of these touch sensor modules and I thought they were two completely different ones. They were labelled as being different, they were different prices, but it turns out they were the same unit. And the idea of these is that you put them inside an existing table light that is suitable for this, that has a metal body but not grounded, and by connecting this sensor wire onto the metal body of the light, it can then switch tongues and loads. It does say on the back that it can switch uh, from 15 to 80 watt incandescent lamp, but it also says from 3 to 10 watt for LED bulbs. Not so sure that I'd trust it with LED bulbs because there's so much variation in circuitry. But anyway, I've got a little rig up here. I shall just grab some power. I shall just uh, stuff it into the hoppy, actually. My other little tester is not coming to hand. I want to use the other tester, it's more convenient. Here it is, I've found it. It has slightly more generous speaker terminals for mains voltage, which is not actually approved in most countries. It's, it's a Chinese device for Chinese factories. So, uh, no, speaker terminals are not very convenient, but not ideal for connecting mains voltage. Although, having said that, many super high power amplifiers do operate at a surprisingly high voltage. So, I plug this in and I turn it on. Notice the pink completely clone Wago connector I've used here. I did resist the temptation of using uh, the little screwets that came with it. I should have done that. I've never really used screwets before. Let's uh, turn it on. I turn it on, it shows a power of about 1.26, 1.28 watts, but that's not accurate. I've tested in another supply and uh, it uh, shows it's about 0.7 watts. Now, when I touch this contact here, the tungsten lights, the fair lights come on at a low intensity, touch it again, they come on at a higher intensity, touch it again, and they come on at virtually full intensity. It says 30 watts, these are 30 watt string of lights. Touch it again, and they go out, and that's really it. Cycles low, medium, high, and off. Okie dokie, right. Let's explore this further, so I shall unplug my dangerous Chinese piece of test apparatus. And by the magic of buying two of these, because I thought I was buying two separate ones, I already have the circuit board out, so let me take a picture of this circuit board and reverse engineer it, and we can explore this in greater detail. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. Look at the tiny track. I get the feeling this is designed to take larger tracks as well. I'm pretty sure I've seen the larger tracks in other versions, maybe from the older era when they wanted to drive larger loads. However, we have the live and neutral, noting that live here, the two are kind of interchangeable, but it affects the sensitivity of the touch very slightly because of the way the circuitry works. But the, uh, the live is effectively the zero volt reference for the whole circuit. Uh, that kind of tallies in with the track being switched with reference to the live with the zero volts. So let's start with the power supply for the circuitry. We've got the neutral here, and it goes via this resistor, and this will get quite warm because this is being used at quite a, a high power dissipation. It's a resistive dropper. It goes via this diode, and then it charges this capacitor as the main smoothie capacitor. The voltage is clamped by this Zener diode down here, which is a 6.8 volt Zener diode. The mains here also provides a zero crossing reference via this 1.5 megohm resistor to the chip so it knows when it's passing the zero crossing point, the sine wave. That's quite important for the timing of the dimming. Another thing that affects the dimming here is this resistor tied positive because it uh, may run an internal oscillator and it determines the steps between the point the thing turns on in the sine wave. So for 100, and, well, for 60 hertz versus 50 hertz, you use a lower value so it runs at higher frequency because it's going to actually reach that time earlier in the faster sine wave. The triac driving is quite unusual but good. Um, the output to drive the track, it's normally pulled down by this 10k resistor, its gate, but there's a capacitor in series with a current limiting resistor, 470 ohm, to ensure that it only provides a brief pulse to the track to turn it on. Anything else worth mentioning about this? I don't think there is. Let's take a look at the manufacturer's data sheet. So here is the manufacturer's data sheet, um, and I've crossed out things that have not been included. They showed two capacitors in series and in input for safety in 
instead of that, they've used it's. I wouldn't call this a class Y, but it is three kV rated. Uh, 470 picofarad. So your main isolation between circuitry and the mains is this capacitor with a 1k resistor, presumably to limit uh, spikes and transients from electrostatic discharge. And there's also two diodes shown here, but they seem to be relying on the ones that may well be in the package. So they've not used the 1N4148 diodes. But for reference, if you do uh, design something with touch circuitry and want a little bit of protection, bit of input protection, 1N4148 diodes seem to be it. That's going up to the positive. I should colour that in. I didn't colour it in because it's not used. The reason I've put all these dots and colours over it is because it's not following the standard, shall we say, the configuration of a schematic, like the one I'd normally draw. But that's okay, we can look at one in the style that I've drawn. Other modifications, they didn't actually show a resistor at all going out to the track, just that capacitor, the 47 nanofarad capacitor. This one, they've nudged some of the values here. Uh, and this one, it says 330k for 60 hertz and 390k for uh, 50 hertz. And then 1.5 megohm is the input resistor. They show 1 to 2 megohm, 2 megohm for 220 volt or 240 volt, and uh, 1 megohm for 110 volt. Other than that, the circuitry is very straightforward. There's the uh, very hot resistor, the diode, and the capacitor capacitor there, and then the Zener diode across that. Let's take a look at a more conventional schematic, which will look a bit like this. So there is the lamp, and there's the triac that's switching it on. There's the AC supply. Uh, there's the 10K pull-down resistor. There's the interesting triac driving technique. It means that no matter how long the pulse of this is the output, the triac just gets a brief pulse and that's all it needs because typically for the dimming, if this was one half of the sine wave and you wanted to turn on at the midpoint, you'd uh, look at the mid, uh, you'd look for the zero crossing reference and then you'd start timing until it was to be at that midpoint. And that's uh, set by this resistor here, the 390k resistor, that timing. So for a 60 hertz waveform, which was faster, it would actually be much faster timing, so it would actually be somewhere over here. However, when it gets there, it triggers the track with just a brief pulse and the track then latches on for the rest of the sine wave until it reaches the zero crossing point again. And that's when it turns off because the current passing through it goes to zero. Um, the tracks and thyristors both latch until the current passing through them goes to zero and then they unlatch. You can force them to unlatch in some instances, particularly gate turn off devices, but it's a bit more complicated. Um, here's a power supply, that big hot resistor, the diode, the Zener diode and the smoothing capacitor. Uh, no decoupling capacitor as such, but they presumably just feel they don't need it. There's a timing resistor that sets the internal clock reference for the length of the sine wave. And here's a a little capacitive resistive network, which is something to do with the timing. Maybe it's a little oscillator they've got on the actual timing, or they just, it's a very sensitive input and they uh, just use this as a filter just so it can actually just detect the slightest change in input. Um, and then there's the sensing, the zero cross point sensor, which comes from the mains through that 1.5 megohm resistor and goes to the zero cross input. And its point is to detect when that changes polarity at the start of uh, each half of the sine wave. And that is it. It's a TT6061A chip, a very standard chip. I do wonder, there is another position on the circuit board as if there's another version of the chip. I don't know. Uh, pin 6 is shown as not connected in the data sheet, and yet they've got a resistor position onto that. I wonder if that's just to make it compatible with other components. Another thing worth mentioning is the zero crossing point detection resistor here. That also goes round to a position for a capacitor, that's the, and if they did that, they could provide a little bit of filtering, so it got a nice solid zero crossing point detection, and also uh, it may be just so they could just nudge that along a bit by introducing a slight time delay. But there we have it, uh, the dimmer module for converting lamps or repairing existing touch lamps. The things that will go wrong with this, the most likely thing to go wrong is the triac. Sometimes when a lamp blows, the triac will just short out and the light will stay on at full brightness all the time. If that happens, it's this dinky little triac here that has failed. It's a really common failure mode. But there we have it. Interesting bit of circuitry. Hackable for 110 volt or 240 volt or probably other voltages and uh, an interesting little thing but only really suitable I would say for tungsten lamps.